The woman Billy Graham calls the best preacher in the family. Ann Graham Lotz takes us through the Daniel Prayer on today's 700 Club Interactive. Hi, and welcome to the show. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you've probably heard the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Well, do you remember why he ended up there? It was because he prayed. On today's show, Ann Graham Lotz shed some light on what Daniel was praying for and how that same prayer can help us today. Ann Graham Lotz has been proclaiming God's word around the world for 30 years. She's been called the best preacher in the family by her beloved father, Billy Graham, who has preached to more people than anyone in history. Like her dad, Ann is also a best-selling author. And her signature events called Just Give Me Jesus have been held in more than 30 cities and 12 countries, drawing hundreds of thousands of attendees. In her book, The Daniel Prayer, Ann outlines the prayer of the biblical prophet Daniel and teaches you how to pray effectively for yourself, your family, and this nation. Ann Graham Lotz joins us now. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Andrew. I loved your book. It was so clear and quick and it had some really profound, thoughtful things. You know, one of my friends, when they first read it, said, I can do this. Yeah. You know, and I thought, good. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, we know we can pray anytime. Yeah. We can pray anywhere. Yeah, it's one of the right. wonderful things about the privilege we have in yeah, our my relationship. My mother called it praying on the hoof. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But you point out Daniel, he took it to a new level. What was special about him and his prayer? Well, the Daniel prayer, which is Daniel chapter 9, was a, time, a set-aside prayer. You know, it wasn't just something you would pray while you're grocery shopping or while you're carpooling or while you're running on a treadmill. The Daniel prayer is um, a serious, desperate cry to God for His mercy, for His grace, holding God to His Word. And so Daniel, at the beginning of the chapter, it says he turned to the Lord God, implying that he turned away from everything else. Mm. So I think there needs to be time in our lives when we draw aside and we turn to God and, and put out the interruptions, the distractions, the emails, the phone calls, the, even the children, the dogs, the, you know, whatever it is, and just turn to God and give Him our full attention. Why do you think sometimes we're prone to not do that? I mean, I think a lot of times Christians know prayer is so important. I think we, we understand, hey, this is an important part of my life, but we neglect it. Why do we do it? Well, for myself, I'll just speak for myself. Uh, one, I'm busy. And so busyness and and just what has been called the tyranny of the urgent, you know, where we succumb to the urgent things, the things we have to do. And sometimes we set aside the most important things. And I think the other thing is that um, sometimes we just don't know exactly how to pray. Prayer in my life, can I tell you, I just be uh, honest, it's a struggle. It's been a fight. I'm not a prayer. That would surprise people. You're Billy Graham's daughter. Well, um, you know, I I pray because I know I need God, Mm -hmm. but I'm not a prayer warrior like some people would be described. It's a a fight for me. I I constantly struggle with content and consistency, concentration. But about three years ago when I uh, got off the road to just spend time taking care of my husband, and and I pray, and I have women who pray for me, so I have a dedicated prayer team. But... But about three years ago, God began to put on my my heart a heavy burden to pray like Daniel did. And I know it's a burden that comes from God because it's just not me, you know. And so to have a a more serious, intense, passionate prayer, uh, not only for the nation, but other things that we go through personally. Um, You know, I've I've prayed that Daniel prayer, the kind of prayer that Daniel prayed, myself in times of desperation. Um, And it's a prayer... Not the words of the prayer, but the pattern in this prayer works. God answered Daniel's prayer in a dramatic way, and uh, and God is still God. Daniel's God is our God. He still hears and answers prayer, and this prayer works. And did God do something in your life where you were instructed by the Holy Spirit before you pray for even the nation? And I want to do some work in your life. How did that come about? <laughs> you know, it's a very painful process actually. But that was several years ago, and I was preparing for a series of messages. And so I set aside time to prepare the messages and I got nothing. So I thought, well, I just need a good night's sleep. So I went to bed and you know, got up the next morning, went to prepare the message, nothing. And I said, God, I've got to do this now. I've got these people that paid money, they're coming, I need to, and nothing. You know? And then there's just that little whisper. And I don't wanna talk about your messages, I wanna talk about you. And for five days, he talked about me. Every time I opened my Bible, every time I opened a book, it was, it was something that leaped off the page. And he was convicting me of sin after sin after sin, Andrew, that I didn't know was in. I was in ministry. You know, I was there to, to lead a seminar to help other people, but he was showing me the sin in my life. So 
So I wrote down some of the sins that uh, he convicted me of. I wrote down some of yours. I mixed them up. I printed them in the book. <laughs> so nobody will know which was which. You know, Painful but, for both of us. Yes, exactly. And, uh, but at the end of that period, the Lord just let me know he was finished. I asked him, are you sure? You know, uh, because I, I wanted a good, deep cleaning. And but you he, didn't start off that way. No, and here you are by no, the end saying, right. maybe there's more. That's exactly right. Oh. And he finished in time that I could prepare the messages. I was able to lead the seminar, but I'll never be the same. And it was, a, it was an experience of personal revival that I believe the key to revival is repentance of sin. But something else, Andrew, repentance is a gift from God. We, we can say we'll repent and we can be willing to repent, but God has to bring upon us a conviction of sin that's so deep that we just cry out to him and we turn to him and and we ask him to cleanse us first. It takes a lot of courage, actually, because what he shows us is so much different than the image that we have of ourselves. And so it takes a lot of courage to see ourselves through his eyes. But when you do, and you come to the cross and you receive the cleansing, um, then you feel like you've had, for me, I felt like I had a bath inside. Mm -hmm. And so Daniel, when he prays, he prays with plural pronouns. So he, pray, he says, we have sinned. We are covered with shame. We have brought scorn on your name. So he's. So when we look at our nation of America, I think it's important not to just keep pointing our finger at them, you know, our culture that's actually so wicked that it's easy to point our finger at them, but we need to look at ourselves first because there's a lot of sin in the camp, as Joshua would say, a lot of sin that we need to turn from before God will hear our prayer and forgive our sin and heal our land. What's this concept of reverse thunder in oh, our prayer life? Don't you love that yes. term? It's a, Eugene Peterson had the term and it's um, where you pray God's word back to him. So in Daniel chapter 9, he, he said he was reading the book of Jeremiah. He came across a promise, and I'm assuming it's Jeremiah chapter 29. After 70 years, I'll bring you back, God said, if you seek me with all of your heart. And so Daniel took that promise, and his, his prayer is based on God's word. And so when we, have, when we go through disaster or a crisis, or now we look at our nation, to base our prayers not on what we want or hope so or think, but base our prayer on what God has said. And so we hold God to His Word, we claim His promise, pray it back to Him, and it's reversing the thunder. And God hears prayer. God, The God of Daniel is our God. He hears prayer. He's a prayer hearing, prayer answering, covenant keeping, miracle working God. You have a very special dad, Billy Graham. He is. And you've obviously learned a lot from him. What about prayer did you, did you learn from watching his life? Um, you know, I love to hear my daddy pray, even now. He, he prays in a preaching voice. You know, I just, I just love it. But to be honest, it was my mother that taught me the most about prayer. And when I went to bed at night, my room was over hers in the house. I'd look out, the light would be on the trees outside. I'd go downstairs, she'd be on her knees in prayer. And it didn't matter how long I stayed, she continued on her knees in prayer. Got up in the morning, didn't matter what time I got up in the morning, she was at her desk reading her Bible. My, my mother was a woman of prayer. And my daddy, I'm sure, prayed. I just didn't catch him in prayer as much as I caught my mother in prayer. How do you recommend in a culture where Christ followers feel a lot of tension with the world mm -hmm. and um, we have this relationship with society that, as you said, we see a lot of things we may not approve of or concerns us, but how do we show the love of God while still expressing our concerns with what's going on? I think one of the things maybe American Christians need to let go of in a sense, and I want to be careful, but um, our, our kingdom is none of this world, you know, and our citizenship is in heaven. And for a long time, to be Christian, to be American was to be Christian, you know, it was all wrapped up together. And now there's come a separation. And I think we have to remember that we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ, so that first and foremost, our responsibility is to share the love of God. But it's not loving, Andrew, not to speak the truth. So when we speak the truth and we get slammed for it, then, then they accuse us of being unloving, intolerant, you know, but that's actually just their spin on something because they didn't like what they heard. But to speak the truth, you know, um, is, the Bible says that the truth is what sets you free, you know, not all the spin. And so we need to speak the truth in love and know that God loves sinners. So, so regardless of what the sin is, how much they practice it, what their lifestyle is, God loves sinners. And that's why he sent Jesus to die, to take away our sin, that we might be reconciled with God, that we might have the hope of a heavenly home. And a wonderful part of your book is we're reminded of the power of prayer and how it does change yes, things. Yes. And sometimes when we don't know what to do or say, yeah. spend time at the feet of Jesus yes. in prayer it makes yes. a tremendous difference. Yeah, it, it absolutely does. And I think coupled with prayer is God's word. I never go into my prayer time without taking my Bible with me. And so I want, to, through the Bible, God speaks to me. I want to hear what's on his heart. And in prayer, I speak to him and I share what's on my heart. And it takes the two, it's a, 
It's a conversation. It has to be, you know, we have all these interactive things today, and, um, and prayer should be interactive with God, where He speaks through His Word, and we speak to Him in prayer. And, and God has things on His heart, and if you don't spend time with Him, you won't know what's on His heart. And, um, and I think He has a lot of things that He wants to communicate to us, as well as things that we want to say to Him. But um, I love to walk with God to the point that um, I get a sense of what's on His heart. And right now, I'm, I'm afraid that judgment is on His heart because of what's going on. But I know salvation from judgment is equally on His heart. And so He's wanting us to be saved from the judgment that's coming. But we need to cry out to Him and pray like Daniel did. Well, I thank you so much for the book. Oh, it's a life thanks, changer. Andrew. Thank you. God bless you. It's wonderful. God bless you. If you're troubled by the direction this country is going, you don't have to stand by helplessly. Imagine what can happen if we all prayed like Daniel. And to find out how, pick up a copy of Ann's book, The Daniel Prayer. It's available wherever books are sold. And thank you again for being thank with you, us. Thank you, Andrew. Well, still ahead, a young man's search for pleasure ends at an altar. I begin to snot and I begin to cry. And I had a real encounter with Jesus. I fell so in love with God that I fell out of love with the lifestyle I was living. Hear how this young evangelist is reaching out to the LGBT community with his personal love story. Stay with us. Well, here's a question for you. Are people, as Lady Gaga's song says, born this way, or can they change their orientation? Kagan Wesley says leaving his LGBT lifestyle wasn't about giving something up. It was about gaining someone in return. I remember my mom and dad fighting. Then that led to sitting in a courthouse and I found out my family was getting a divorce and that from that moment everything would be divided. That's when confusion was inserted into my life. To expedite that confusion, I went to a birthday party and that's where my life was forever changed. I was in fourth grade and um, it was just regular boy birthday party. You know, I was expecting PlayStation games and, you know, hide and go seek or whatever you're supposed to do in a normal sleepover as a young child. And, you know, we did all of that, play basketball outside, and then it got late. And that's when I was raped and molested by several men. And I remember those older men, you know, holding me down and teaching my peer peers what to do. I remember after, you know, the men were finished with me, I went outside and uh, physically hurting, emotionally hurting, uh, not knowing where to go or who to go to. And if I went to somebody, what was I going to say? And if I told them, would they even believe me? I didn't think to tell my parents because I was so scared that somehow fingers would have been pointed at me. This must be my fault. So I buried it in the back of my brain, suppressed it in my soul, and hid it in my heart as I looked at the stars crying, wondering why this happened. I ran to substance, I ran to alcohol, drugs, you know, relationships, uh, popularity, being a bully, just anything I could do to take my mind off the situation. I would wake up in sweat and screaming of just that event replaying in my dreams. I didn't see the older guys um, often, sometimes at basketball games and things like that. But my peers, I ended up having relationship with them from, you know, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. I was, I was really twisted to the point where anything and everything went. Um, whatever drug, whatever drink, or whatever dude or girl. And so I found myself just trying to find anything and everything to satisfy the cry in my soul. I don't know if you would consider that, you know, bisexual, homosexual, not really sure what kind of label we could put on that other than desperate. I really didn't know if God was even real. I, um, I had a desire for him in a sense, but I didn't know how to find him. My family went to church for the Christmas service and the Easter Bunny service, but I didn't know much of Jesus. There was that question of, God, if you're real, why did this happen? When my mom invited me to go to a Eddie James concert, um, I remember sitting on the fourth row and I was watching the people on stage sing and dance and give God all that they got. And they were like wearing leather pants and they loved God. They had snapback hats on and they were saved. And I was like, this is a really rad place. And 
when they were singing and, and giving God glory, I realized that it wasn't a performance, but it was something personal for them. And I just said this in my heart, God, if you did this for them, would you do it for me? And it was an unforgettable moment. I walked up to the altar and I didn't really know what to do or what to say. I just knew that I needed Jesus to do for me what I could not do for myself. And I lifted my hands and I lifted my heart and it was like this love hit my life and I began to snot and I began to cry. And I had a real encounter with Jesus. And that's when I started to fall in love with Him. Eddie James came up to me after that church service where I had that moment with Jesus. And he said, I wanna give you the opportunity to come on the road with me, to travel with me. He gave me two weeks to make a decision to go on the road. And it was through his ministry where I learned about the Lord. I don't even know if I was converted or completely saved before I went to be in full-time ministry. I went just to find out who the Lord was. And through finding him out, I fell in love with him. As I fell in love with him, he healed my heart and he started to restore my soul and mend my mind and literally love me back to life. I fell so in love with God that I fell out of love with the lifestyle I was living. I was able to forgive those that hurt me when I realized that they were hurt as well. When I realized that it was not personal, it was spiritual. You know, sometimes we like to get back at the people that got at us. It wasn't them trying to kill, steal, and destroy me. It was Satan. They were just as much victims as I was. And as much as I need God's mercy, they do too. It's the amazing thing about mercy when you put yourself in somebody else's shoes. I've been forgiven of a lot, so why would I want to hold forgiveness back from somebody else? Mm. Often we want people to come to us come to our church service, come to our church conference, where Jesus went to them. Jesus sat with sinners. I think we need to constantly be in the face of people that are in the homosexual community. We need to place ourselves in position to love them, to serve them, to have conversation with them, to care for them, and to be Jesus to them without trying to change them, without trying to convert them, and just share the love of the Lord that would draw them to repentance. The gospel is offensive, but we don't have to be. If we just place ourselves in their lives and show how in love we are in, with the Lord, people will want Him. I so appreciate Kagan's transparency and his willingness to share the journey he's been on and is still on. And through no fault of his own, he was the victim of a tremendous violation. And maybe you've been in a situation in your life where you have been a victim of molestation or rape or something that should never have happened to you and you were violated. And it sets you on a course that you weren't prepared for, that you didn't want, and now you're seeking to recover from. Kagan said very honestly, I didn't know what to say to Jesus. I didn't know what to do. And in some occasions, that's the perfect place to be. Because we feel oftentimes like we need to clean ourselves up before we try and enter a relationship with Jesus Christ. I need to present myself more holy, more clean, more valuable in some way. And Jesus just says, come to me as you are. Because Jesus did the work. His sacrifice on the cross and the blood that he shed for the forgiveness of our sins that sacrifice is what cleanses us. That's what we claim. We come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm living a life that I know is not godly. I know it's not your plan for me. I'm in bondage to something or someone or a particular lifestyle. And Jesus, here I am with my sin and my filth and my confusion and my questions. And I've heard you're a savior and that you came to save my soul. And even though I don't know exactly what to say, I'm pleading with you for mercy and grace. And then Jesus begins to take us on a remarkable journey. He shows us those next steps. What he begins to do is call us into obedience to him and the way he wants us to live because he wants us to have an abundant, joyful life. The Bible says we can cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us. Scripture says we are his masterpiece, that we're created in God's image and too often we're distracted by the things of this world. 
We spend more time following people on Facebook than we do following Jesus Christ, the one who died for our souls to save us for eternity. If you're in a situation now where you're lost, you feel hopeless and confused and you say, God, I may not understand all you have for me, but I want to give you a chance to work in my life. The Father comes running. Our Heavenly Father comes running to respond to a plea like that. And I encourage you to pray with me now. Lord God, I'm told of your love for humanity and for me. And right now I lay down all my issues, all my confusion, the choices I have made, Lord God. I even put at your feet the ways I was violated, that I had no choice in the matter, the ways I've been hurt and harmed. And Lord, I ask you to heal me. This Holy Spirit of God that I hear about, Lord, I ask that Holy Spirit to work in my life. I give you all that I am, all the mess, all the sin. I bring it to you and lay it at the cross. And Father, I pray now that your Holy Spirit will cleanse me because of the work you have done, not because of what I have earned or what I have done or even what I can give, but because of what you have done, Jesus. Take me, cleanse me, transform me into the child you want me to be. I accept you as my Savior. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We would love to hear from you if you've prayed that prayer, if you have more questions, if you want someone to pray for you. Give us a call at 888-777-1999, or you can log on to 700clubinteractive.com. It's our privilege to pray for you. When we come back, see how you're helping orphans in Beijing who are aging out of the system. That's coming up next. The young children in our next story were labeled as untouchable. Some were abandoned at birth, only to be abandoned again as teens. But there was one group dedicated to them for the long haul. And they're getting help from Orphan's Promise. Laura grew up in an orphanage. And since she was little, she's had nagging questions about her parents. I wonder why they threw me away, she says. She hasn't seen them in 14 years, since she was two years old. Laura was a Chinese throwaway baby because she was born with a rare genetic disorder called osteogenesis imperfecta, or brittle bone disease. Charlotte was born with the same disorder. Orphanage workers were afraid to handle her for fear of breaking her bones. So she spent most of her first four years in a crib when she was rescued and brought to Agape Family Lifehouse a year ago, she could only make baby sounds. She was five years old. Agape has become a haven for children who suffer with this rare and misunderstood bone disorder. The complex is located in a residential neighborhood outside Beijing and is sponsored by Orphan's Promise. Workers and house parents are unlocking the potential of these children while helping to heal their emotional traumas. Clay and Jewel have been house parents for four years. Sometimes they look at themselves and they're like, what am I ever gonna do? So trying to, to build their self-image and provide an education for them. One of the best things Agape House is doing is finding a solution for this crippling disorder. About 10 years ago, Director Keith Weiss started bringing American doctors to train the Chinese in surgical procedures. They learned to use rods to stabilize and strengthen the bones in the children's arms and legs. The program is very successful and has become well known across the region. Because children grow so quickly, surgery is an ongoing process. Through these endless cycles of surgery and therapy, Agape is involved for the long term. Some of the younger children are adopted, but many age out without finding a forever home. They were abandoned when they were born. They turned 14 and they were pretty much abandoned again. No, no family came along to adopt them. So they, they kind of got hit twice. And, you know, uh, what do you do with those kids? You know, do you just give up on them? Eh, I don't think so. That's not what we're here about. It's just finding that, that thing that God has given them as a gift. How, 
can we use Stephen's musical talent? How can he use that in the future? Uh, Laura loves hair, you know, so how can we encourage her? How can we help her be a hairdresser? Or Candy to be a, um, a librarian. She said she wants to own a library because the books will be free. We want to try to find um, where their niche is and where they can fit in. The atmosphere of love and trust is quite a contrast to most orphanages, where imperfect children are often misunderstood and forgotten. Charlotte has thrived in this environment. She's clearly happy and has made great strides in her social interaction and language skills. Laura, too, has blossomed. After getting prescription glasses, her academics improved dramatically, and so did her self-confidence. And though she will always wonder about her parents, she told us, I would have no life if I stayed in my old orphanage. The house parents here are very kind. I think that's our goal, to make them feel like they're as normal as we can. You know, that give them an environment where they can grow just like any other child. Orphan's Promise continues to support this ministry because we see older children like Laura have hope for a happy and productive future. And that's something every child deserves. What a tremendous difference we are able to make thanks to people like you. These precious children outcast once and again, given a new chance at life, thanks to the gifts of CBN Partners. If you'd like to join with us, join the 700 Club. It's just $20 a month. And you can do that by calling us at 888-777-1999 and say, I'd like to be a 700 Club partner and join what you're doing at CBN. We leave you with these words from the ninth chapter of Daniel, verse 9. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against Him. If you need prayer, give us a call, 888-777-1999. We'd love to pray with you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.